Okay, here's a question for you. How many Nazis and or Holocaust deniers and or explicit white nationalists or pro-Confederacy fetishists are running for office this year? At least half a dozen, and weirdly, they're all running as Republicans, including the actual avowed Nazi, Arthur Jones, running in a Chicago-area congressional district, who Republican Senator Ted Cruz of Texas instructed voters not to vote for, even if it meant choosing the Democrat. There's also a Holocaust denier running for Congress in California as a Republican, a white supremacist running for the State House in North Carolina. In Wisconsin, Paul Nillen, the self-described pro-white candidate, once the darling of Breitbart and Steve Bannon, is running for Paul Ryan's seat. Pro-Confederacy candidate Corey Stewart is running for U.S. Senate from Virginia. He's been openly supported by President Trump. And then there's this guy, Seth Grossman, running in a swing congressional district in New Jersey, who made plenty of bigoted remarks, but only lost his NRCC endorsement after Media Matters unearthed his enthusiastic endorsement of a 2014 white nationalist propaganda piece that said black people, quote, are a threat to all those who cross their paths. Karine Jean-Pierre is a spokesperson and senior advisor for Move On. Jason Kander is a former Missouri Secretary of State, currently uh, president of the voting rights organization Let America Vote. And Evan McMullen is the former chief policy director of the House Republican Conference and ran for president in 2016 as an independent. Um, Evan, you know, the, the, the Arthur Jones story in, in, in Dan Lipinski's district in, in Congress, you know, is, it's a little bit of a weird one. He sort of snuck in there. No one had filed. He's an explicit, like, American Nazi um, you know, that could be sort of chalked up as a kind of weird wrinkle of this sort of odious gadfly. But there's more than that here. There is something that's really unnerving here. Am I wrong? No, you're right about that. But I think even in the Arthur Jones case, he made a decision to run as a Republican. And true, he, made, he might have seen an opportunity there to gather the signatures required and sneak onto the ballot when no one else would, given the nature of the district. But there's a reason why the Republican Party is attracting these types of candidates, and, and it's because there is uh, an audience in the party for this kind of candidate, for this kind of corrosive, cancerous, un-American ideology. And, and these candidates are, are running as Republicans, not Democrats, and there, there's a reason for that. Yeah, this, the, the Grossman story is really remarkable to me, Corrine. I mean, this is someone, this is a swing district. This is someone who there was a lot of stories about really nasty stuff that he'd said, bigoted statements he'd made. He, NRCC had endorsed him, stuck with him. And then this is what he wrote. He wrote, he wrote this, he, he linked to this article, and the article said this, my experience has taught me that blacks are different by almost any measure to all other people. They cannot reason as well. They cannot communicate as well. They cannot control their impulses as well. They are a threat to all who cross their paths, black and non-black alike. That is textbook, textbook white supremacy racism. Yeah. And here's the thing, Chris. I mean, white supremacy racism has been around for a long time since the beginning of this country. So that is actually not new. What's new here is the they are now empowered to publicly run, right, as a white supremacist and all the other awful, hateful things that they are listing themselves under. And that is what has changed. And I think the direct link to that is Donald Trump. Uh, Donald Trump has given them the green light to, to be public, to be out there because he doesn't have a he doesn't have a whistle he has a bullhorn when he talks about racism when he talks about this type of white identity politics that really all of this is under and uh, and when you have the head of the Republican Party when you have the president of the United States Donald Trump watching uh, uh, protesters neo Nazis marching down Charlottesville yeah. and praising them what are you doing you're enabling that you're giving a green light to that and that is what where we are today unfortunately yeah, you know, the Nillen, the Paul Nellen case is interesting, too, uh, Jason. And I want to be careful here. I mean, mainstream Republicans really have rejected Nellen. He's, you know, there's a lot of folks who've said he's odious. But this is a guy who the president tweeted about enthusiastically, backed by Breitbart. Bannon was a big fan of him, I think appeared at a rally, who is started, you know, tweeting about the Jewish media all over the place, calling himself pro-right. Like, he is basically, like, out and out anti-Semite at this point. And this is a guy who was like a stone throw away from the power centers of the Republican Party. Yeah, there's a couple of things here. One, is, as has already been alluded to, you have the President of the United States emboldening these folks. I mean, literally referring to them as very fine people. This is not history book stuff. This is on the march right now. And then the other piece is the policy side of this, and that is the fight for voting rights, for instance. We have to recognize 
not that these fights are back from the past, but instead that the civil rights movement never actually ended. If you go to Birmingham and you go to the museum there and you look at the articles on the wall, you'll be immediately reminded of the fact that the march in Selma was about registering to vote. And what are we talking about all the time right now? We're talking about, uh, you know, just the last couple of days, a, a, a possible Supreme Court justice who is really opposed to voting rights you know, largely for certain populations in this country. So, you know, this is scary because you have a president who is telling these folks, uh, you know, sending them signals that this is okay. But it's also scary because of the extension of it that says it's okay to suppress the voice of whole populations of the country. You know, Evan, did there, I think there's a question, you know, during the primary in the first part of the Trump administration about sort of his relationship with the conservative movement, the Republican Party, it's been belabored a bit. Um, but at this point, it does seem like that his vision for what the Republican Party is, is what the, the party is at this point. Yeah, that's right. And, and I think one of the problems that the party has is that it views these candidates naively and incorrectly and, and opportunistically in some cases as anomalies. And, and that's just, it's, it's wrong. I mean, Donald Trump saw this opportunity within the party in 2011 when he started with the birther nonsense. He saw that around that time, 45% of Republicans thought that Obama probably wasn't born in the United States. That number rose by the time we got to May of 2016. 69% of Trump supporters, those who felt favorably about Trump, believed that Obama probably wasn't born in the United States. And this has been a problem since, you know, since the Republicans took the Southern strategy. Um, but it is, so it is not an anomaly. And I, I would like to comment on something Jason said, which is a good point, which was the civil rights movement hasn't ended or it shouldn't be thought to have ended. We have to understand that the, the fight for equality is one that's eternal. There will, there will always be voices who try to divide us and try to say some of us are better than others. It happens around the world. It will never end. That's why Republicans, Democrats, and everyone else, as Americans especially, because this is fundamental to who we are, we have to understand that this is a fight that will always continue. We yeah. always have to be committed to that principle and actively fighting for it. And if Republicans don't actively fight for it and only occasionally comment on these these lunatic uh, white supremacist candidates, they, they will see their party taken over by this movement. Quickly, Corrine, the other thing is the president refers, talks about Muslims and immigrants particularly in ways that are entirely consistent with how these folks talk about black yeah. people or Jews. That's exactly right. I mean, that's the whole point. That is the, the, the message that, the, that Donald Trump has been sending them. That's why they're doing it. That's why we see anti-hate groups have said there's been an uptick, uh, a record number of white supremacists running uh, this, this time around in this election. And here's the thing, 88% of Republicans support Donald Trump. So this is the Republican Party. And they've enabled it, they've fostered it, they've allowed this. One last point I'm going to make really quickly. In 2012, Mitt Romney sought after Donald Trump's uh, endorsement, even was going to give him a primetime slot in the convention until the hurricane happened. This is a year after he was the grand wizard for the birther movement. Yeah, people have been playing with that fire, Jason, for a while. Yeah, and at the end of the day, if you're a Republican candidate or a Republican office holder right now, you got to draw a line and you got to say, look, I expect my commander in chief to have the courage to stand up to the KKK and Nazis. Like, mm -hmm. period. Yep. And, if, and if it's a minimum bar well, to that, hop over. Yeah, and he failed that test. And I will say this for the mm. NRCC, they did the right thing uh, uh, in, yeah. in the case of, of that New Jersey race. So kudos for them on that. Corrine Jean Pierre, Evan McMullen, Jason Kander, thank you. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.